It's Foos Talk Live. Are you talking to me? Compelling and lively banter. Are you going to talk to us? Talking foosball. Foosball was how I measured my value as a man. You took that away. Players and fans, promoters and pros. Unedited and raw. Talk, talk, talk. Living in the moment. We have a lot of important things to talk about. All while practicing social distancing. Cool. We'll talk. No big whoop. Let's get this thing started. Foos Talk Live. And here we are again at a happy Father's Day. Hey there, I'm Tom Robinson with Booze Talk Live. Uh, we're about to celebrate uh, Father's Day properly, especially fathers who like to play or have taught their kids how to play or perhaps uh, just encourage their kids to play. But uh, fathers of all kinds will be honored this evening on Foos Talk Live. Uh, brought to you this evening by 518 Prince. Uh, also brought to you by Foosball Clubs USA. And we want to uh, also remember the guys from Tony. Uh, uh, it's a foosball by Tony and foosball by Brandon as well. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to having a great evening with you once again on our new date and new time, Sundays at 9 o'clock. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and, of course, uh, I'd like to honor one of our most well-known dads uh, when it comes to Foos Talk Live. Uh, he's a dad. Uh, he also teaches his kids how to play and encourages them to play on a regular basis. And he just happens to be one of the world's greatest uh, foosball commentators of all time. Uh, please welcome Jim Stevens to Foos Talk Live. Thank you, Tom, and uh, happy Father's Day to all of you out there. You as well, Tom, and and uh, I, I certainly had a great weekend here with my family and a, a nice dinner tonight, and uh, we can talk a little more about that as the show goes on. But uh, good to join you again on a Sunday night, our second uh, Sunday night show of uh, this year. And uh, what is this, our eighth or ninth overall? We're talking 10th tenth, tenth, uh, episode. I'm always one or two behind. What's, what is that? <laughs> Ten episodes. That, that is really something. And, and this one tonight is kind of a special one for me. It's sort of old home week. Uh, yeah. the, you guys will know what I'm talking about as we, uh, as we get to our guests here in a little while. And perhaps a couple other uh, callers who we could consider special guests as sure. well. Sure, sure. No, it's uh, we we are uh, building this uh, this thing one brick at a time, or shall we say, one play at a time. Uh, this whole idea of Foos Talk Live, because of course, uh, it's it, we're not able to really get out and play in mass or in in large competitions. We're using Foos Talk Live to help relieve the stress and get the. Uh, get the, uh, well, at least talk about playing, uh, if nothing else. And uh, so if you've joined us for the first time, Foos Talk Live is something that uh, is really uh, something we enjoy doing. And Jim, I got to say, uh, you as a, as a forward player for my, uh, my uh, defense, mm -hmm. I, think, I think we're working out pretty well so far. P pretty well so far. And keep up that good passing, if, if you don't mind. Uh, the more <laughs> opportunities I can get on that three row, the better off we're going to be. Oh, you got uh, it. Because the five, eh, you know. Yeah. But, uh, I'm just going to. Th thanks for your support back there, Tom. Oh, you're very welcome. My, my pleasure, absolutely. So, uh, you know, this this uh, this is a momentous occasion because of the fact that it's Father's Day, and of course, we can we can chat a bit about dads. Um, how many second generation players that are out there on the tour right now can you think of right off the top of your head? Oh well, certainly at the top end, there are, there are quite a few. In fact, if you look over the last ten or twenty years uh, in foosball history, most of the very top players are all at least second generation, from Frederick Colignon to Billy Pappas to Ryan Moore to Tony Spreadman to Robert Atha. All of them are products of foosball families and uh, foosball fathers, and it's uh, it's kind of a neat thing that that we have going. And again, it's a kind of a testament to to the fact that if you're going to be the greatest at something or among the greatest. You got to start early, and of course, if you are the the son or daughter of a foosball father and mother, you're probably starting pretty early, as my kids are. Ari is eight, and Kian is now six. Turned six wow. a couple of weeks ago, and uh, and both of them are on their way, hopefully, to someday being great players. But uh, but I think there's something uh, something to be said for that second generation player of uh, resulting in outstanding players. Oh, yeah. No question. If it's something that's in the house and you have uh, every opportunity to practice. And of course, uh, a person who comes to my mind would be uh, someone like Terry Rue uh, yeah. with his daughter, who is just, you know, stellar. She's an amazing player. Uh, now, uh, let's see. Now, his daughter is how old now? Sullivan Rue, I'm going to say, is now 17. I, I think okay. I'm, I've got it. I'm, if not, I'm very close. And she is one of the best lady players, certainly on the tornado table. And I think destined to be one of the best, if not the best, uh, lady player in the world, multi-table. Uh, certainly has already won a gold medal with Team USA last year in Spain. And, and wow. uh, it has just had a tremendous amount of experience on the tour already. And, of course, coming from a, 
a foosball family where the entire family plays foosball uh, sure. has been extremely beneficial to her, of course. Yeah, no, no, it's 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 really astounding. And, and of course, it's not just dads and sons, it's dads and daughters. So yeah. well, there you go. It's an equal opportunity uh, situation for uh, being raised in a foosball household. Uh, it's funny because I don't recall my parents even acknowledging the fact that there was a thing as foosball. I don't think they had any concept whatsoever. Uh, I think they knew I was disappearing to the pizzeria, you know, uh, several nights a week. <laughs> I don't think they, they comprehended that I was actually doing that to spend the, the, the evening playing on a Bonzini table. So Boy, young Tom sure enjoys his pepperoni pizza, pizza doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> it's like okay i mean at least he's still in the neighborhood there's, there's yeah. a, that's all that, that mattered at that time so no no and it's great uh, for fathers to be able to hand it down to the, to their kids and uh, and be role models on the table and you mentioned terry rue and there is no better role model in the sport than terry and it shows uh, sullivan yeah. certainly with a great attitude on the table great approach and that's uh, that's part of being a great player you got to be a good loser you got to be a good winner which yep. might be even more important uh, and she is certainly both of those and a, and a product of, of a really good, solid dad in, in Terry Rue. Oh, it's, it's a great way to build character. And of course, it, they're doing it together as a family, which I think is really terrific. You know, that's yeah. it's a bonding, bonding kind of thing. It really is. And so, so how's the weather in, in uh, upstate New York this weekend? And I know you had a, a couple of issues earlier in the season uh, with tornadoes, <laughs> although you said last week that it was in the low 80s, I believe, and, yep. and sunshine and and you were already kind of expecting the other shoe to drop. And now here we are a week later. And how's the weather been? Right. It's, it's actually uh, I'm, my my Irish is kicking in here. I'm worried because it's been <laughs> so beautiful now for what, eight days, stunning and upper 70s, mid 80s. Actually, today it gets 92. Uh, oh, wow. Which is unusual for us. But uh, the pool actually is warm enough to actually get in. So yeah, go figure. But uh, no, it's it's. Uh, I'm worried because uh, if if something this nice is going on for this long, something bad is bound to happen. Mm, wow. <laughs> Live in the moment, grasshopper. Come on. Okay. Be here uh, now, my friend. All right. All right. Um, here, here in Durango, we went uh, camping for the third weekend in a row. You know, with the kids home twenty four seven, you got to get them out. Camping seems to be a, a, a an outlet for them where they can ride the bikes and and hike and play in the river and everything yeah. else. So we've done it three weekends in a row. It's been a success each time. Uh, got back this afternoon, went out to a, a nice Father's Day dinner here at a, a, nice. a local cattle ranch, actually about uh, 10 miles north of town, a place called James Ranch, uh, where, the, the, where they have just outstanding uh, grass-fed beef, great burgers, right, um, great food, uh, sitting right there overlooking the big cattle pasture. So which, uh, sometimes if the wind blows the wrong way, uh, make, flavor your burger just a little bit, but uh, but a so, very enjoyable meal today with the family. What's a Father's Day dinner uh, involved for you? What it was your choice? Well, I had the I actually had the the beet and uh, goat cheese salad to start. Okay, and then what's called the garden burger, um, which is a, a a burger cooked medium, of course, as all burgers should be. Okay, um, and then with their special sauce and some lettuce that they grow right there. Everything that they that they serve you there is grown uh, either locally or on the ranch itself, and. Uh, it was outstanding. And then, then I hustled home, of course, to, to be able to come on to, to Foos Talk Live here on Foosball Radio. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, when it comes to restaurants in Colorado, are they, uh, there are restrictions in the, the amount of people they can have in the dining room? Well, they are. I think occupancy has been cut in half in most cases. One thing they did here in Durango, which was really interesting, we have a historic downtown area, uh, which has always been two lanes of traffic on each side. Sure. But what they've done recently is they have taken out one of those lanes, created a a turning lane in the center you know, where you can turn from either direction and then a single lane on each side. And then for that, what was formerly the slow lane, so to speak, uh, they've actually put up barriers and they are allowing restaurants to come out actually into the street downtown to put tables to increase their occupancy to hopefully keep them in business. And in this town, certainly restaurants are a big deal. Uh, very competitive here in Durango. We have some great restaurants and I'm afraid we're going to lose a few of them, but the, the city doing all they can to help uh, keep some of these guys in business. Yeah, no kidding. I know it's it's been tough because uh, you know just takeout is not enough to survive on. You know, no. uh, it's just it's the kind of thing that I think hopefully with uh, with a little bit more time, a little bit more, uh, shall we say, a, a bending of the curve or or putting the you know uh, making sure that people are more safe, that uh, these restaurants can bounce back. That would yeah, be nice. yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and even in the foosball world, perhaps as we look forward to the return of the tour, and I, the next schedule event is October, or rather August 7th through 9th, uh, okay. down in the mountains in North Carolina. But as we get back out on tour, maybe some of these kind of ideas can be implemented. 
Obviously, we're going to have to spread the tables out wider. In many cases, they're hanging shower curtains between uh, tables oh. and restaurants. Not sure that would work for us necessarily. Sure. But uh, we're, we're going to find solutions, I'm certain. And at some point, we'll, we'll be coming back. Alan Reese, uh, uh, Mr. Big Money himself, is, is hoping that'll be his weekend in uh, August. And, and time will tell. Right, right. Exactly. Time will tell. And, and fingers crossed that uh, hopefully at the very least, you know, by the end of uh, 2020, this will all be behind us in some way, shape or form. Oh, we, sh- we certainly hope so. Yeah, that would be great. Well, you know, I think it's a uh, high time that uh, we toast the dads. Uh, yeah, I think we need to idea. toast our dads here in in uh, in foosball land, foos talk live. Uh, whether you whether you uh, have a dad who taught you how to play, whether you're a dad who is te- teaching your kids to play, or whether you're just a dad that kind of goes, oh, that looks like fun. Um, it doesn't matter. We're going to toast you right about now. So, uh, Jim, I would say that uh, you may do the honor since you are the dad. Tell me what kind of a Dad's Day beer or IPA are you drinking this evening? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Odell Brewing um, on the front range of Colorado here makes a double IPA called a Mercenary, M-Y-R, Mercenary. M-Y-R-C-E-N-A-R-Y. It's 9.3 alcohol by volume, and it's an 80 on the IBU, which is a bitterness scale. Uh, very, very good. One of my favorite double IPAs, and not as good as the Melvin 2x4 that I've had on previous occasions, but okay. very good. Okay. Uh, enjoyable beer, and it's especially good on a Father's Day. How about you, Tom? Well, you know, uh, I'm I'm not a real dad. I'm a cat dad. I guess that's sort of a dad. But uh, I still I want to toast uh, my my cats. <laughs> uh, but no, they uh, they suggested I try the truth. Oh, okay. Yep. The truth. The truth never hurts. Yep. The truth uh, by Flying Dog Brewery. Uh, the Imperial IPA, 8% alcohol by content. Now uh, I did pick this because of the label. They have great uh, labels. Uh, Yes, the artist is uh, is is a uh, is Stedman. Are you, are you familiar with Stedman at all? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. He's the guy who uh, Ralph Stedman did a yep. uh, a lot of illustration for. Um, uh, Fear and Loathing. Yeah, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. With uh, well, Hunter S. Thompson. Yep. But uh, the truth label is just great, and it says on uh, one part, it says, um, uh, "Let's see, I got to take my glasses off." Uh, I do solemnly swear, and uh, okay, let's see if it makes me swear. Hold on a second right. here. All right. Mm, smells great. Oh, oh, that's hoppy. My, my, my. That is I have a- had that beer. You have? I have had the truth. Yes, I have uh, from Flying Dog. I believe they're out of Maryland, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, yep. And it was, it was very good. Oh, yeah, it's uh, it's stout, but it's uh, we'll take it for sure. The truth. Uh, we must tell the truth, uh, whether it be foosball, foos talk live or life in general. We must tell the truth. So help me foosball. <laughs> oh, yeah. OK, well, and congratulations to all our dads. Yeah, absolutely. Here's to all of you. Um, keep up the good work. Yes, and indeed, and bring your kids out uh, as often as you can to uh, either watch or play or whatever the case may be, but uh, get them involved. Well, okay, so what about our guest this week? Now, he's a, he's a wonderful coach from what I understand. He is. Uh, he, he's a lot of things. Uh, you know, so many of the players we've had on here, I hearken back to the, when we had Tom Yor on here, who was a player, an official, and worked with me in the booth. Well, our guest tonight has spent uh, a good solid three decades on the professional tour as a player, mostly as a goalie, um, and had some success in open events throughout the years. He's played uh, on multiple national teams overseas. I've played on several different tables with him on the U.S. national team uh, over the last 15 years, I guess. Uh, Also a team member and a two-time gold medal winning coach of Team USA. Wow. He, He was also a member of the team. Uh, they lost in uh, the year, I'm going to say 2013, uh, they lost in the finals to France. But, um, but he was a member of that team. Uh, he worked with me uh, with Inside Foods for many years as my engineer working uh, the mixing board. And, of course, any of you who saw the, uh, the 2006 World Cup that we put on uh, last month on Inside Foods TV, uh, he was the man handling the camera down there in the pits. Um, and uh, really a, a guy that traveled internationally at least as much as I did, and maybe more, and is a beloved figure uh, among the international set, uh, a guy who is uh, not only a great coach, a great guy, a great pool player, a great photographer, and a great friend of mine. And I'd like to welcome none other than Mr. Ezekiel Iceman Moore. Hello, Ezekiel. Are you there? I'm here. How are you doing, guys? 
Good, good. I, I, thought, I think I left you speechless after my introduction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did have me speechless there for a second. I went, nah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good to hear your voice, buddy. Hope you're doing well. Iceman, also a, a delivery driver for uh, UPS for what a quarter century, I think, quite a long time. Uh, and, and he also tells me that he hates Amazon, hates them. Um, but <laughs> um, well, there goes the sponsorship. Okay, yeah. no darn it. Uh, but 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 Ice Man and I go way back. Um, of course, uh, Ice. You know, you started playing. I know in the in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and I know that the story involves Steve Murray and how he kind of brought you along, and and you played goalie for him. And I think he even gave you the nickname Ice Man, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, he did. He um, gave me that name. He was, I was at his house one night and I was, we were playing uh, just pickup games. And he started to do what, like what you're doing now is commentating. And he was saying that he couldn't tell if I was winning or losing by the look on my face. So he, he said I had a, he said I had ice water for veins. And he said, it's the ice water for veins. Oh, wait a minute. He's the ice man. And ever, ever since then, it's, it's just stuck. And you and you played you played tournaments with Steve, and I know you had some success uh, locally. And then out on tour, what, what were some of your, your best finishes uh, out on the, uh, the major championship tour? Um, Charles Britton and I had maybe the best finish. Um, I think that might have been third place at the Masters in Atlanta. Nice. Charles and I were also that that year were the first team to beat uh, Terry and Todd when they had first teams up. Right. They seemed they seemed to be just unbeatable. Nobody could touch them. And um, me and Charles pulled off the huge upset there. That and must uh, have been oh, that was awesome. <laughs> Man. Uh, Steve and I, I think the best we did was um, a fourth place at a U.S. Open. Gotcha. And and a couple of other big ones, but oh, me and Steve got second at the uh, uh, Halloween Open, which at the time was a huge tournament. Yeah, no, I remember that. In Oklahoma, Link Penley ran that event uh, every October. Um <laughs> No, and you, you had success as a player early on. Uh, and then I think early 2000s, I think, is when you started uh, coming into the booth and working with me. I know you expressed an interest in, in video editing, and we talked about that. And then before you knew it, you were working the mixing board. And, and you worked uh, the mixing board for some of the biggest matches in the history of the sport. And talk about that a little bit, what it was like sitting down there, really with the best seat in the house, uh, just a mere couple of feet away from table number one. And mixing, of course, but also watching some of these great matches. What are some of the, the biggest matches that you can recall that you, that you worked in the inside booth with me? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think the, the biggest match that I can even think of is when uh, your friend Paul, I think Paul Ryans was helping us that year with his, his boom cameras from yeah. uh, L.A. And that year, to, to me, that year was the uh, the best covered event ever because we had every angle, every everything <laughs> was covered. We had, a, we may have had 13 cameras on online, and there wasn't an angle we couldn't catch. Which put a lot of pressure on you because you had to pick out those angles, right, and go to that particular camera. Yeah. That was, I believe, 2006 uh, Tornado World Championships in Las Vegas when. Uh, when we had all those different camera angles. We also, I think, of that one had uh, Tracy McMillan and Dave Gummison mic'd as well, so we could hear what they were talking about during the timeouts, and you also had to control that audio volume uh, for that as well, didn't you? Yeah. And, uh, Tom, I'm, I'm going to let you in on a secret. Okay. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take credit for a little credit anyway, anyway for what you see now as a product. Okay. Uh, on inside, on inside food or, or Kazoo. Uh, one year over in France, they uh, they were having they were going to have Jim just do the commentary, so they didn't they didn't need him to bring any of his uh, 
uh, equipment than any of his, his cameras or anything. Okay. And the Kazoom crew was going to do everything. So I was just sitting there in the stands, and Kazoom crew had this million, multi-million dollar operation. And I'm sitting there looking at the guy's mixing board, and it's probably a $5,000 mixing board. Ooh. Easily. So, and I'm just kind of like looking like, oh, my God, look at this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, they tried to actually film a match. And they wanted him to try to commentate it. And after about a minute and a half, <laughs> Jim's like, no way. I, I can't do this. What is wrong with these people? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I looked at Jim, and I was looking at the guy when he was actually operating the board. And I looked at Jim and I said, Jim, dude, I think I can run that board. He said, really? I said, Jim, I think I can run that board. I said, it's got all those buttons on it, but it's still basically the same operations of what your 16-button board has. Mm -hmm. This is, just has 50 on it. 50, yes. Okay. So he said, man, if you think you can run it, I'm going to go ask these guys and let you run it, and we'll go from there. I said, okay, fine. That's fine with me. So Jim comes back, and he says, uh, hey, uh, Xavier, I think it's his name, who was running Kazoom at the time, he said, they're going to let you run the board. I said, okay, cool. So then I would, I would do... My my fade into the tables, uh, quick cut here, quick cut there. Guy scores, you get uh, a reaction shot. Uh, I mean, it, it just went on and on and on. Yeah. And, and then the match was over. Jim comes up to me. He almost runs over me. I might have hugged you. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> It gives me a monster high five. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> nice. And, and he said, that's what I need. That's what I'm talking about. And then the guy, uh, Xavier, I can see him walking up. He's like, he's just shaking his head in disbelief. He's like, how do you do that? Uh -huh. I said, do what? I said, do what? <laughs> how do you how do you make those decisions so fast? How, I, there's no way I can do that. I said, dude, I'm a player. I know who's, right. who's fast, who's slow. I know everything about what, what's going to happen on the table. Yep. So so I, I can anticipate. And they had, being that they were new, they had no anticipation. Hey, Ice Man. Ice Man, this is Jim. I got a question for you. Would you agree that Mark Torres is the best color commentator of all time? Hold on. It sounds like we have a special guest piping in here. Yeah, we have, <laughs> yeah, we have somebody to ask you a question already. Oh, man. Jumped in and it's Jim. Would, would you agree that, it's the that Mark's the best? And another question. Did you ever want to lean over and kiss him the way I did sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> What's uh, up, dude? And obviously, folks, that is the voice of none other than Mr. Mark Torres, the infamous one, uh, the greatest color commentator of all time and the worst. Um, yeah. Live with us here, and of course, um, it, and we talked earlier on, Mark, about how this was going to be a little bit of an old, old home week with, with Iceman. Uh, you and me and Iceman and Brad Anderson, I kind of expect to hear from as well. Spent a lot of great weekends together, didn't we? Oh, well, well let's call this the most diverse episode of Foos Talk Radio of all time. You got a, <laughs> you know, you got uh, two other ethnicities represented here, but hey, I'm excited to be here, you guys. And yeah, we, gosh, so many fond memories, so much nostalgia. Right, ass Iceman. I mean, looking looking up and down at each other, having fun doing this stuff. Wasn't that great? Oh man, that was awesome. It was awesome. Yeah, what are your Iceman? Now you sat there and listened to Mark. You had headphones on, and I oftentimes caught you laughing. <laughs> uh, oftentimes there were other expressions on your face uh, as well. But uh, talk about your memories, uh, Ice, of, of having uh, of Mark Torres in the booth. And, and Mark also worked some of the biggest matches ever. And and Mark, uh, who can be very insightful. 
uh, much of the time. Uh, what are some of your memories, Isa, of Mark working with us? Oh, man, was, the best thing, I, I, I guess, would be the how well y'all work together. I mean, it, it was obvious. Even sometimes you can tell when people are it's obviously are friends. You know, you, they, you go back and forth, <laughs> and you joke, and you laugh, and you commentate all at the same time. I mean, it, sometimes, sometimes I would kind of almost pull my headphones off and turn around and look at you guys behind the glass like, oh, are you serious? <laughs> I can do Mark, can you totally picture that look? Oh, I can. Yeah. yeah. So here's my secret about Iceman. Like oh, there's two okay. things. There's one regret and here's my so I would look down at Iceman as a check. Like he's my barometer. If he looked up at me and give me the head shake like nope, you cannot do that. That's wrong. I knew I had pushed the envelope. But the one regret I have is that I made so I made work so much harder for Jim cuz I would like uh, I I'd get out there and I knew Jim had to do so much more editing. Like when I'm when I'm up there and I'm just going off, I knew Jim was gonna have to work his tail off. And um, Jim, how far was it when we before we got to the digital stuff? I think early on, I don't know if we were digital yet, but like if you had to go back and manage all that tape, oh my goodness, oh. I feel badly about that. Incredible so. amount of work, buddy. Incredible amount. Of, mostly worth it. Mostly worth it. And, and, and truth be told, there are a couple of matches in the uh, Inside Foods archives that will never be seen. Have Ooh. never been seen up till now. And, and coincidentally, both of those matches involved Mark Doris in rare form. Um, but, uh, that's, that's code for probably 25 drinks in. But keep going, no, Jim, please. Here's listen. the key. Here, here's the key with Mark. Between, between drinks five and eight, he is awesome. After eight, eh, then we're in trouble. <laughs> Things go downhill fast. It was in Las Vegas after all, Tom. Uh, I see. Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm very interested to hear... Um, First of all, um, Iceman, you you answer me this question: uh, mm -hmm. How did the, how do the have these guys actually been objective about the, uh, the the games that they they commentate? Are they are they biased towards one player or another? Well, uh, I think they they were objective. Okay, uh, I don't. I mean, I don't see them. I did never did see them being bi well, really biased toward one player. I mean, they always, they knew the players were game so well, you know. So. Right, 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 right. Okay. Well, I mean, I, it, it might have slipped out once in a while. You well, know, Ice, Iceman is being kind. Iceman is being kind. I, I can interject. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not trained at sports commentary. It was something, it was something incredibly fun. I'm, I'm grateful for Jim for all the years of being able to do it. But I'll be, I'll admittedly say that I would show bias Unfortunately, and I would try to have levity, but the reality is, like, if it was a friend of mine up there, um, I tried. I really did try. And to be frank, in a lot of the big pit matches, my friends would lose because they were, I mean, that's honest truth, right? I mean, I can think of many times my friends lost a big match in the pits. But especially if it was someone I revered, I remember specifically watching Steve Murray. Um, he was playing, was he playing in the finals, Jim, or for third or better in open singles? And it was not, it was, must have been 10 years ago. Refresh my memory. Who was when Steve got up in open singles? Who was he playing? Remember? Oh, that's a great question, Mark. I wish I had an answer for you. Um, I think he might have been Rico or somebody. It could have been. Yep, it could yeah. have been. Yeah. So he got to third or second, and I wanted Steve to win so bad, and I just <laughs> couldn't help myself to like have a completely distorted, um, you know, de delivery of ah, Steve. I mean, I wanted Steve to win so bad, but that's just the reality. So thank you, Ice, for trying your best to. Reflect me as objective. I think there are definite times when I <laughs> use the commentary. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, I am I am completely objective. Although I came off as a bit of a prima donna in that story earlier about Kazoom, uh, and I think you exaggerated the minute and a half. I think it was about thirty seconds when I were fed up with them. But, um, but another thing, when it comes to objectivity with me, I you know when I go overseas, when I work international events, the World Cup, or World Championships overseas, whatever, you know I I'm not an American. I can't be an American. I'm simply a, a commentator. And I can show no bias. And maybe sometimes I even go a little bit too far the other way, mm. in not showing bias. And I think that's kind of natural. But uh, that's actually a great question, uh, Tom. I, I try my best not to. And if I do have a bias, you're not going to know about it. Okay. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Now, it's, it's, it's tough because when I watch uh, a baseball game, let's say, and you've got, uh, you know, commentators who are in the booth uh, and, you know, maybe they, they belong to the home team, but they've got to they've got to acknowledge the fact that the other team is slaughtering their their side. 
they got to be objective, right? They can't be, uh, you know, uh, bad mouthing the team, if, especially if they're losing. Yeah, no, that's for sure. And, and I uh, talk a little bit uh, in, in March, stay on, hang out if you want. Um, and hopefully uh, Brad Anderson is going to join us here in a little bit as well. Um, but talk a little bit, Iceman. I know you and I went overseas for the very first time back in 2006. When we went to Hamburg for the, the World Cup. That was our first time. You really fell in love with playing overseas and going uh, to international events. Uh, and we can certainly share a few stories. Most of them happened uh, later in the evening after the, the play was over. But uh, talk a little bit about your international experiences and how you really loved that. And it was a regular part of, of your uh, foosball year for, for many years. Um, well, I'll uh, well, tell you what, the first thing that I remember that uh, about uh, international play and it was uh, Hamburg, of course. And basically, I know you remember this uh, as a member of Inside Foods. Uh, we get there, Tom, we get there, and they've got this set up how they want to see, to have things viewed. Yep. And it's it's a bad setup. Huh. It's a very bad setup. Uh, Jim can't even really see the tables that he's trying to commentate. Really? And I'm down there on a handheld camera trying to fight and everybody, everybody else is doing video. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we go back home to the, uh, to the hotel. That was day one. Yep. Yeah. We have like a, we have like a uh, team powwow, and we are all sitting there, and we're like, "This is not going to work." So now, what are we going to do? And I don't know if I think Jim maybe c did come up with the idea, but we said, "You know what? What time does that place open?" <laughs> and <laughs> and we said. Once we figured it out, we said, okay, we're going to go down there, and as soon as that place opens, we're going to go in there, we're going to move this, we're going to move that, we're going to push that up, we're going to pull this out, and we're going to have it all done before they get there. Oh, nice. Okay. And so we, and we were able to do it. But the look on their faces, the guys that were uh, running the event, the look on their faces when we, we were all sitting there like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> they, yeah. they the noticed. look on their faces. <laughs> oh, yeah, the look on their They were walking in, walking in and doing a little talking. And they looked up and they were like, what the hell? What? Where is? Oh, and we were like, you you just, we don't know what happened. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what are you talking about? I don't, we didn't see nothing. Faint innocence. I yeah. love it. I love it. But it all worked out. It actually was a better setup. And we, I think we got down there at like 8 a.m. We, we just, it was very frustrating for us. We went back to the hotel, as I said, and set our alarms, got up early, had the early breakfast. Um, and, uh, and got down there and, and just did it ourselves and it worked out and, and they were happy with it. Once they saw it, they went, okay, yeah, I, I can see how this is better. Um, and, and of course the rest was history with that 2006 world cup. And those are some of the great memories, right? I, so of those sorts of things that have happened over the years, you've already uh, covered two of them. The first two world cups, we seem to have issues, didn't we? Um, but, um, you know, these kinds of stories that did, did Mark and, and, and Ice and myself and Brad and anyone else who has worked with us up in the booth, it, it really was a special time uh, during the, the 1990s into the 2000s and then, of course, into the 2010s. Uh, hanging out in the Inside Foos booth was a pretty cool thing, wasn't it, guys? Oh, incredible memories, man. I, I, I'll say this out there. I'll put this out there. Um, working in the Inside Foos booth is a true labor of love, and I mean that because um, – you, you really got to want to be up there and engage the players from that perspective and, you know, be entertained and observing at the same time. And there's a sacrifice. And the sacrifice is it really, I mean, Jim, I know that if you weren't in the inside booze booth, 
you probably would overall probably be a better player, right? Because you'd probably be playing in the tournaments, practicing. You cannot do both. So I'll mm-hmm. say this for everyone who spent that time, especially you, Ice, and, of course, you, Jim, that um, be, delivering the players the content, and, and you can't go without saying, and I, I, this is my first time on the show, um, Jim essentially being the um, universal librarian for the history of foosball has delivered so much substance and content, right, for people to learn and engage the game. And he's like, Jim's got to be one of the central pieces to people being able to be better and better at foosball. Part of the sacrifice was himself not being able to develop really any further as a foosball player. That being said, I know you had a great win. I don't know when it was. It's a blur. You won with Joe Hamilton somewhere, right? You won a pro open doubles or something? Back to back, Those moments happen, right? Good stuff, man. I mean, so it was a great time, you guys. And ice, yeah. ice, uh, you know, ice was, and, and when ice wasn't playing, and ice was a player, and, and I don't think it hurt him a whole lot. Of course, as a goalie, maybe there's a little more room for error. But when he wasn't playing, he was in the booth. He was mingling with the, um, with with the players there in the pits. Only the top players, of course, and and also as you said, Mark, <laughs> uh, providing uh, his part of the content, and just really wonderful days. And I, I have tremendous memories from back then. Certainly, very warm memories of working with with you guys, and I miss you both. Well, let's get the band back together. I'm a uh, <laughs> man. Sounds a good idea. Yeah. Well, you know, after all this time and all this history that's gone between you guys, I mean, do you, do you still send each other birthday cards? <laughs> I'm horrible, man. I don't call my – I have four sisters and a brother. I don't know when's the last time I talked to any of them. So, hey, if I'm not getting your birthday card, just realize there's a huge list of people that I neglect. I love you. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> have your own way of showing it. It's okay. It's fine. Yeah. No, you're, you're uh, Mark. I got to say, it's it's a pleasure to meet you, and I, and I'm I'm finally getting the getting an idea as to what they mean by your uh, quote unquote reputation. I don't know <laughs> what that means, man. That's probably more of a bad thing than a good thing. Um, <laughs> but I get out like twice a year, and once hopefully is at the Hall of Fame Classic. So there's all this pent up, you know, party in me. But um, I I, uh, I I love when I can support foosball in a way that's not belligerent. How's that? Is that a good decent answer? <laughs> <laughs> that's a positive. Be your epitaph, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. right. That's my claim to fame. Oh, you know, we should bring back trash talking. I think that would be a, a great for the game, you know, especially when it, when it comes to being live on TV. Or, like ESPN or something. <laughs> what do you guys think of that? What's your honest opinion of – because foosball, it, you know, I saw the transformations. I've been around the game for 30-plus years. There was a time when you could be more engaging, and those various opinions, I don't think – I mean, I didn't play in the 70s, and so I don't know about all the jarring and all the heavy – um, power in the game. There's a lighter table, all that stuff. But what do you guys think about a more um, interactive type of game? What, what's your thoughts, Ice? What do you think about that, that? Man, I don't think that would happen today. It's it, it's it's kind of like all of the sports around the day now is how the game has evolved. You know, and how they have the big arguments all the time. If can would this player be able to play? You know, 20 years ago, uh, would that player from 20 years ago be able to play now? Mm-hmm. I mean, surely, for sure, you have. You no, know, every every uh, every everybody doesn't have a Todd Lafredo. He's that he's that one anomaly. True, but you know, I don't. For the most part, I don't think. I mean, it, it's like I said, it's just a different game now. It's, and I don't think I don't think anybody Tony's game wouldn't be that good because if you're going to allow somebody to jar, Tony's game is pure precision mm-hmm. and pure pure speed. And if you get the bumping that table real hard, his game go. What about the trash talking? What I mean by that is like people are drawn to emoting and emotion, and whether or not you like some of the players, I can name. And so and there's a line with trash talking. I'm not talking about abusive, you know, um, divisive language. I'm talking, if you saw someone like Murray or Tommy or even Johnny, when they, when they kept it in line and when it was between balls, and there's still some of that going on. And there's obviously a lot of other sports. I mean, look at the NBA. They're trash talking the yeah. entire time. Sure. I'm wondering if there's a place for that to color the game. Uh, what, I mean, what do you think, Jim? 
No, I, I think there is. And I think it's probably would have to be a, a separate event of some kind. But, you know, I, I think back a couple of years ago in a match uh, on table number one at the World Championships in Kentucky, where it was Ryan Moore and Bob Diaz going up against, I believe it was Tommy Atkinson and Robert Atha. And you've got two of the greatest, I mean, two Hall of Fame trash talkers on the table. Tommy Atkinson, who, in my opinion, <laughs> is number one. And you have Bobby Diaz, who is somewhere in that top five, from, from two to five, somewhere in there. Um, and is also a great trash talker. In, but Tommy Atkinson is the best. Tommy Atkinson has always kind of reminded me, and we're going to date ourselves a little bit here, but the, the pool player Minnesota Fats. Yeah, who would walk around that table, would have some little subtle digs for the opponent, would continuously talk them and work them. And that's Tommy Atkinson. No pun is, intended, he, but keep going. Sorry. He is a genius on, on as far as, um, as trash talking on the table. So we still get a little taste of that here and there. Obviously, you mentioned Steve Murray as well when he's playing matches. He's very vociferous and a guy that is entertaining, Johnny Horton, uh, who is now uh, retired and uh, was, could be entertaining if he didn't cross the line, which was most of the time. Right. Um, but it, I think still some of that exists. But, you know, uh, a made-for-TV sort of thing where that was involved, I think there is a place for it. And in this COVID era where there is no tour and where changes perhaps can be made and things can be tweaked a little bit, maybe that's something we'll see down the road. Well, you know, we, we don't need a John McEnroe necessarily. Um, but you think about the contrast because, okay, just to give you a quick example, an anecdote. A couple of years ago, there was a New York State Championships uh, here in the Albany area, and uh, there was a side match called the New York Cup. So it was, a, it was a, a rotating group of people that were chosen to play in the Cup. And during that, you were encouraged to cheer for your team, for your, for your uh, particular you know, uh, 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 group of players. Now, as that's going on, there's also other matches happening currently you know, behind us. Uh, we're sitting in stands, and we're cheering and make noise. And there's a group of players, I believe they were from Canada, that came over and complained to the uh, to the main desk and said, "Hey, these you got to keep this down. This is you know it's distracting us from our matches." So okay, now in in Europe, when uh, you're playing, uh, you know the final matches, there are what uh, sometimes a thousand spectators yeah. cheering. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what's missing in this country. It is, and and so often, while we do have oftentimes for World Championship finals, uh, we do have uh, you know 100, 150 people sitting there watching. These are people who have probably been playing foosball now for five or six days in a row and are a little beaten up and a little worn down, and we don't necessarily always get the reactions we would hope for. Um, sometimes it has to be contrived a little bit, even with signs or whatever. But when we have gone to Europe, and I see you know very well uh, about the crowds in Nantes in particular, who, who were many of them were coming off the streets there in Nantes, but were very involved in the matches, and every goal that was scored would have a reaction. and. And that really does give a tremendous environment to a match, doesn't it, Ice? Yeah, it sure does. I mean, we were, you know, even in Hamburg, when we, when we found out people were actually paying to get in to watch yeah. foosball, we, the, we had to kind of pinch ourselves a little bit, <laughs> you know. And then when, when the event moved to not, and, you know, we would be, driving down the street of not and this billboard would go flying up and it had Ryan Moore Tony Spreadman on it and we did you see that whoa, whoa, whoa. but there's another one <laughs> and then when we got to got to the uh, arena and you get to play in a match and you, you look up and it is standing room only I mean it, that's it amazing was, yeah. Yes. It's hard to believe. It's still hard to believe. Yeah, no, jam-packed crowds, and I'm up there right in the middle of it, which was which was really cool. Um, and it, uh, it, it really does, as you say, Tom, those sorts of crowds, that sort of environment just adds so much to the sport. And believe me, it is something that has been on my mind the last few months as I look forward into the future and where Inside Foods and Inside Foods TV are headed. And certainly the creation of a, a an environment that, that really duplicates other sports in, in particular. Sure. Um, an arena type of setup where you do have the crowd very involved with the match itself. And, and these are things that uh, I do give thought to because it certainly enhances my product. And I, and I think it's, it's good for the sport overall. Oh, yeah. No, no question. It's about the passion. Uh, it's so cerebral when you go to a, a, you know, a tour stop in the United States. Uh, it's, there, there's no talking. You know, when you're in play, there's no talking. There's, you know, people are standing around. They're very respectful. I, you know, I dig that. But 
you know, there's, there's got to be that element somehow, maybe in specific events only. Who knows? Just yeah, kind of out there, sure. you guys, because I'm thinking about it right now. So it's, or, it's organic to the conversation. Why can't, I mean, people will bet on anything in Vegas. So why, what is the plan? Why can't you get like bookies and odds makers to prop, like at least in the Golden Nugget or Flamingo, to proposition bet on the Foosers? We'll get a bunch of weirdos who are betting to come into the foosball tournament. You'll fill the stands with people who have money on the games. Is that just odd? Never so we, no, no, I think it's a great <laughs> point, especially these days. Yeah. So yeah. it have to be uh, Spraderman with one to one odds there. That that would have to be it, right? Um, yeah. Yes. One to one. Absolutely, or less, eight to five. I think when that's, I think that's probably the controlling element. Now that I'm thinking it through, if they don't have enough information, then you get weirdness. You never know, right? Not to t- take anything away, but you never know how foosers figure out how to beat a system. I love my foosball community, but maybe that's the maybe that's the variable. Well, yeah, it I, could be. You just never know. You just never know. Right. Well, Iceman, um, you were a member, a playing member of Team USA. What, was that 2013? Is that, do I have that year right? Or it, it's somewhere in there. Um, you played for Team USA. And, and then uh, these last two World Cups, you've been the head coach. How did that come about? How were you approached to be the, the head coach of Team USA? Um, you know, I, I sometimes wonder how that came about myself. <laughs> Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, as as you know, uh, I've only missed, and I like I said, I've only been. I did coach two teams, and I did play on one. But other than that, other than that, I had, I had been to every single yep. World Cup awesome. just to go. It's awesome. Yeah, and Rob Morris called called me one year. And say, said, "Hey, Iceman, I need a favor. That I need a, co- I need a coach." I said, well, uh, "A coach of what?" <laughs> 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 you know, I, he said, "I need somebody to coach the team." I said, "Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. I, yeah, I'm in. Sign me up." And ever since then, uh. He's just uh, pretty much, you know, made me a, a, a standard. And I've been kind of the, uh, the utility guy as well. You know, he kind of threw me in there with Dan Barber because uh, Dan, Dan partner wasn't able to play or something like that. So I ended up playing a lot of senior matches with Dan Barber last year. Yeah. Got it. Now, now, as the coach of the team, of course, these are some of the greatest players of all time, probably don't need a whole lot of coaching. Uh, what are your duties? Are they more administrative, or, or do you actually contribute to the strategic side of it as well? Um, well, like you said, these are some of the, be- the best. Well, I shouldn't say some of the best. These guys are the best. Yep. Uh, every single one of them. If they're not in the Hall of Fame, they soon will be. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's it's just about knowing what the game plan is going to be, and to try to make sure they hold to that game plan. And every now and then, like like uh, I think I was telling Tom last year. Uh, yes, they. Well, I forgot who. I think we were playing Luxembourg. And Luxembourg was making a big comeback on us. And according according to this new format they had, uh, we were in trouble because we had two players on the table that were going to get stuck on that table, and we were going to probably lose 11 points until we could get somebody else on that table. Wow. So... uh, I think it was Todd Lafredo and and um, Blake. They were playing, and this team, their goal, they what their goalie was killing us. He was hitting banks left, right, you name it. And I knew what they were trying to do. They were trying to cover one side. Todd would take the other side, but it wasn't working. So I just kind of screamed out to Blake. I said, hey, man, Fulcrum, you know, that's, that's an old school defense. 
I said, just fork them, fork them. And Blake kind of, he acknowledged me and he looked up and then he went back down. And after that, he they shut everything down. Nice. So. Yeah, nice. Yeah, no, it's. So, so, so you do contribute a little bit on the on the strategic side as well, or at least here and there, you're able to, to point something out that, uh, and of course, you have a great foosball mind. You've been involved with the sport for so long at so many levels. So that has to be beneficial. Uh, as well, and, and and so you have two gold medals and a silver medal hanging in your in your trophy room. Yeah, that's that's awesome. that is awesome. <laughs> wow, how many people can say that? So, so Iceman, I remember when we were talking on uh, Foosball Radio last year, you mentioned uh, for the World Cup in Spain, there was a little bit of controversy going on there. Can you expand on? Oh that a bit? man, you're trying to give me a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, if you'd rather not talk about it. <laughs> I'd rather not. Uh, and Jim knows this one real well, too. Uh, we leave, and, you know, the qualifications, I think, are, are already, already done. And in the process of leaving, we get this message that we don't have to play until, I think it was 12, uh, 12 in the evening. I'm like, okay, cool. So, the message, we got the message around to everybody, and everybody's like, cool, we don't have to play the first match in the morning. Uh, however, uh, to, to me, something didn't seem right. So I knew that Fareed was in our hotel. So I told myself, I said, look, uh, I'm going to get up early in the morning. I know Fareed gets up early in the morning to eat breakfast. I'm going to get up and I'm going to ask for eating. Uh, I got up and here he is walking through the door and I said good morning. Went through all of that and I, I asked him a question. I said, well I was told that we didn't have to play until 12. He said, well wait a minute now. I wouldn't who told you that? I went, oh, my God, don't tell me this. Don't tell me this. He said, your team lineup needs to be in no later than 9, 930. Oh. So I, think the, I think, yeah, because the first match was, I think, uh, scheduled at 10. So he said, uh, you have to be there at least by 930 to turn in your lineup. And I'm like, this is not going to be good. So I go down there, and I see Fareed sitting at one of the tables, and he looks up at me, and he goes, are you going to be ready to play in 30 minutes? I went, oh, oh my <laughs> God. And Jim, I don't know, I looked up at Jim uh, when I got the chance to see him. He looked down at me, and he knew what was going on. I'm like, dude, what's going on here? I said, oh my God, we're gonna look, we're gonna get forfeit out, you know, because we were in different hotels all across the city. Oh boy! And these were the yeah. semifinals on on the final day of the event. It would one be one semifinal, then the other, and apparently, yes, some some messages uh, got communications got crossed, and and of course, Billy Pappas never gets up till about eleven fifteen anyway, right? So. Uh, so this this was going to be you know Brian Brian Moore doesn't take his first bong hit till eleven a.m. So you guys are in big trouble. <laughs> that could be a problem. <laughs> Billy still needs to go to Carl Jr. in Hamburg, wherever the hell that is. So it's a tough day. <laughs> Sorry. Just oh, facts. Just it's facts. Uphill as we speak. That's great. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so continue, Ice Man. What exactly did you do about this? So uh, I asked for Reed. I said, well, wait a minute. Uh, I said, how much time can you give me? He said, can you be ready to play by 1130 or something like that? I said, man, I don't know, but I'll try. So right off the bat, I called Rob and called him. And then he answered the phone. I said, dude, we need everybody here now. And I started calling who I could get a hold to and whoever – you know, it, it, I started like a network. Everybody that knew all the players, 
I say, hey, man, do you have so-and-so's number? Do you have so-and-so's number? Call them. Tell them we need to be here. I was rooming with Tony at the time, so I told Tony when I left, I said, hey, man, I, I got a bad feeling, mm -hmm. so just just be ready. If I give you that phone call, just be ready to play. Right. So, and Tony was, he was ready. But, you know, like I said, I think it, I think it actually backfired on them because everybody was so ready to play when they got there. I mean, we destroyed the next team. So, I'm just, <laughs> just to clarify, I know because we talked about this briefly as well, uh, this was an intentional act on their part, correct? It, it sure did seem like it. Okay. I mean, it, I hate to say it was, but I mean, a lot of stuff, we, I heard that it was a lot of miscommunication okay. within their own organization. But And I think that maybe because of that, Fareed maybe have realized you can't penalize a team for something that his own people uh, conveyed to us as information. Right. So, yeah, I, I got, I got a little more on that, too. Yeah, it was definitely within the organization. It was not intentional at all. It was just one of those things. It was just a left hand, right hand thing uh, that uh, that ended up happening. Yeah, this can happen in an event like this, and it all worked out in the end, which is good. But I, I can I can attest to the fact it was it was not an intentional thing at all with with any of the the, the factions of the ITSF or any of the the national teams. But but it was stressful for all of us, and I, I remember that well. I got a question for you guys. I want to. This is one that's stirring in my brain. All right. Between uh, for both you, Jim and Ice, who is the greatest active foosball player that has not ever played a World Cup? Hmm. The greatest yeah, I, active player. I think that... I've got that one for you. And and uh, if you go to Inside Foos TV, Mark uh, put up a nice little post on this guy. I'm, really, I'm Bob, Bob Diaz. That's who I'm it's going It's a good for. one. I, it's yeah, a good I, one. I think he's probably the only really top. And we're talking about a guy who's one of the top two to five greatest goalies of all time. Uh, and he he is uh, he he has never played doesn't fly I suppose he doesn't fly overseas and, and has never played for Team USA I, I, that would be mine what about you Ice? Well, I didn't quite hear. Who's the greatest? Um, who's the greatest active foosball player that has not played a World Cup? Oh, the greatest that has never played a World Cup. Oh man, that could, ooh. <laughs> Tommy, Trevor, have those guys played? I wouldn't know. It was totally blank. Um, yeah, was Trevor has. Tommy, Tommy has not. Trevor's played. Yeah. Um, hmm. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, Tommy Atkinson played at the 2007 uh, ITSF World Championships in Italy. That was the multi-table world championship yeah. event, which he took second in open singles to Frederick Collignon. But he has never played for Team USA, and he would be the other one. You're right about that, Mark. Uh, Greatest goalie, certainly Diaz. Greatest forward would be Atkinson of the two guys who have not played. Uh, it, because most have, either as a, as a, men, a men's team member, a women's team member, or a senior member uh, as well. Good stuff. Ice, we, yeah. Ice, you can post that on your Facebook page when you come up with someone different uh, yeah. down, down the road. No, but, it's, what? If anybody, oh, wants to, no, if anybody wants to participate in that one and they have uh, a name they want to toss out there, absolutely. Uh, you know, us, for the, for the, the longest time, and for the longest time, it was Steve Murray. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I finally got him in the, in the making it, you know, making that decision to go ahead and play in uh, international play. But for the longest won, time, he did. He won three gold medals. He, he never, yeah. Wow. He never over Steve. <laughs> wow. And I kept telling them, I said, dude, you have to go. Serve your yeah. country. Johnny, <laughs> yeah. Horton, Johnny Horton might be a, like a more of an outlier, but he might, I don't know, did he ever play a World Cup? Can you envision that? It would be amazing, wouldn't it? Yeah. We would never, we'd, we'd be disinvited whenever the next one was, but it'd be great. <laughs> You're listening to Foos Talk Live here on Foosball Radio. Uh, uh, if you have any questions for Iceman Moore, Mark Torres, Tom Robinson, or myself, give us a call. Just push that uh, that I believe it's green phone down at the bottom of your screen. We'd love to hear from you. Still waiting on Brad Anderson, and apparently Brad maybe out for Father's Day is what I'm thinking. Yeah, uh, I've not heard from him, but we'd love to hear from callers. If you have any questions, comments, if, if you're a fan of Iceman Moore, as I know so many of you are, uh, or Mark Torres, as I know about half of you are, 
Um, <laughs> Less than half. Please, uh, 40% please. if we're lucky. <laughs> no, Donna, we have uh, we do have another caller coming through, and uh, welcome to Foos Talk Live. Uh, thank you for joining us. Hey, it's Liz. Hey, Liz. Hi, Liz. How's it going? I'm a big Iceman fan for sure. Um, we go way back. So. <laughs> Liz, <laughs> I still you, love Iceman? you. Liz, I still um, love you. But go ahead, let's move forward. <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks. Um, anyway, uh, you know, I love talking World Cup stuff, but but just listening to the last story, it just made me think about um, a World Cup situation in Spain, and I was just wondering if Iceman even knew about this, but um, the women's team, we had to play a match, and uh, so you know how they have the zones where they have, you know, four of the tables or two of the tables with the country that you're playing against and so on. And in our zone, we had um, a coin op tornado table. And I had requested that they swap it out. I'm sorry. It was the other way around. It was a, a, a home, model. home model. Yes. A, a home model. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, long story short, um, they didn't want to do it. Um, I went up to the stage and, said, hey, you know, it, this particular table plays differently. We're used to the coin op. Um, it, it's just not the same. So, anyway, long story short, it just came down to they weren't going to do it. And they basically told me, they being one particular uh, staff member and then a ref who I don't recall his name, that there was no difference between the two tables. Okay. Um, and uh, thankfully, uh, the men's team did come to bat for us. I think I found Terry Rue, and then later uh, Robert um, told him about it. But about an hour later, uh, they ended up getting it switched out. And I was just curious to know if the men's team had any issues like that or if that's ever even been an argument for you guys because I just was just dumbfounded that they were arguing with me about the fact that the two tables were the exact same and there was no difference between the coin op and the home model. No, they, we never had any of those problems uh, other than maybe, you know, having some type of issue uh, with a rod or whatever. Uh, we never had an issue like that. Yeah, I know the senior team had a, an issue as well. I know they lost, I believe, to Great Britain um, which was a shocker, and a lot of the, those of you listening in, in Great Britain. But the, the men's team, uh, the senior team, lost a match where they did not remove a whole model table. And if you're a tornado player, if you're really familiar with the table, as you say, Liz, there is definitely a difference. Uh, you're, especially you're accustomed to playing on the heavier table. Uh, the characteristics of the table are 10% different in many ways. Uh, and it was an issue for the senior team as well last year in Spain. And you know, a lot of times I think that just comes down to the the, the the crew, that the logistics crew who maybe just doesn't want to have to do that extra work. Because these guys, <laughs> Tom, these guys are, are moving tables in and out constantly. It's they're on to put them on wheels. They're, there's five different types of tables, uh, brands of tables uh, that they're constantly moving in and out. And I think sometimes it's a logistical thing, a time thing. Uh, thankfully, though, Liz, the, the men maybe came to your rescue a little bit along with your own uh, perseverance and you got it done. And eventually you really got it done with that gold medal. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it was just fantastic that uh, we got to win alongside the men. That was really so much fun. And uh, of course, Iceman. Actually, I think it's weird calling him Iceman. I like to call him Ezekiel personally. Um, but uh, just just love you to pieces. And, and you've been a longtime friend and, and just so wise on the table. Um, I can think of so many times when he has, uh, you have, Ezekiel, mentored me through matches and and given me advice and we even got to play together i believe a time or two um yeah. and uh anyway so well, big can, fan <laughs> can, real quick can i say uh you know liz is known as this great great uh female forward and she may and she, i'm pretty sure she's gonna remember what i'm about to say uh liz still has the most impressive uh, display from goalie that I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> wow. I and do know what you're about to talk about, yes. <laughs> see, he knows what I'm about to say. Uh, 
it was a local DFW tournament. And Miz scored eight consecutive goals Whoa. from goalie. Eight. Oh, that's crazy. It was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> and I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, I was, I was dumbfounded. But I was, I mean, I couldn't believe it. It was awesome, though. And, you know how I would love to tap into that again. <laughs> <laughs> Liz is mostly known as a forward, of course, one of the great lady forwards of all time, but she's a really good goalie, no doubt about it, both offensively and defensively. You just don't spend as much time back there, although you did at, at the World Cup last year, thankfully. Uh, uh, yes. Part of your winning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I, really... I totally believe that. I, I, I can see that happening for sure. Yes, yes, Iceman. That was a uh, good, good, good times, good memories, and and I'm so glad that you were there to witness that because I, I love how you uh, share it every now and again, <laughs> every ten years or so. <laughs> I played with I played with Liz about four years ago in a pro doubles, and she couldn't hide me to save her. She tried to put me everywhere on the table, and I was just worthless. But let me tell you, you about let me tell you about Torres and, and how that went. Ah, I'm going to carry right. you, Liz. This is going to go great. <laughs> We're going to kick everybody's butt. That First happened. game, uh, I don't think Torres blocked a shot. No, um, it, 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 was, it, was, it was comical. <laughs> that was belligerent, and uh, it, was, it was really, really sad. I'll tell you this, though. A Hall of Famer is a Hall of Famer, and you know they, Liz played great. She's always playing great, so I apologize for being drunk, but I, you knew I was going to get drunk. <laughs> I did. I did. I went into it. I went into it knowing. But uh, anyway, Ezekiel, I look forward to uh, our next World Cup. I hope you're there. I'm pretty sure you will be. But uh, anyway, Sorry. it's a pleasure listening to, to you tonight. So this well, we got you here you. before you yeah. before let us go. Uh, because we got all you your World Cup types here. I want to ask you all the question, what's going to happen? Because I mean, this pandemic is not just the United States, it's also Europe. What's going to happen for next year? What do you think uh, will take place? I, I have no idea. I mean, my, my heart was broken not long ago because uh, a few of us women were planning on going to the Leo Worlds. And um, I was just, just, you know, biting my nails. Please don't cancel. Please don't cancel. And then, of course, you know, they did. And, yeah. and for good reason. Yeah. Um, I don't know what next year is going to look like. Uh, I really don't. Um, we're kind of at the mercy of, of uh, the virus and, and people who organize these events. So it's, it's, it's kind of a situation where it is, it is what it is. So, I mean, I hope that uh, we can compete next year. Um, but if we don't, we don't. And, and, and we just wait for the next one. Uh, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Sure. Uh, I, I say that for now, <laughs> but yeah. um, you know, I, I don't know. The whole qualifying situation is, is going to be interesting. Um, I don't know that that's going to make much difference on, on the team, um, but but it kind of does. I mean, I know the selection committee kind of, you know, has a, a big job to do. And, 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 you know, sometimes people who qualify uh, for an event, that's a consideration for the team as well. So, I mean, who knows? I mean, I know Nationals was supposed to be a qualifier. So now, now what? Right. Oh, Jim, do you, Jim, do you have insight on that, Ezekiel? I, don't, I mean, I, what? I, I, I don't, but I, I, I can only imagine that we, if we do get to a point where it is on, that we will condense and concentrate those, um, those qualifiers into the end of this year, hopefully, and then uh, uh, next year as well. Uh, but it's tricky, and it's it's one of those situations again that just doesn't seem to have a, an obvious solution, and that we really have to search for compromises and uh, and solutions uh, to these issues. And and a lot of it is we just have to wait and see. There's there's too many unknowns. Yeah. I still think between now and then. Right. I agree. I agree. I and, like it, and it's actually a good thing that we do every two years now versus every year. So I think that's a little helpful. Yeah. But I will yeah. to bribe my way on that team. You point me in the right direction. And I'll write yeah, a I check. Can. I'll get you hooked up, buddy. Yeah, Thank no you. Yeah. Make it out to Jim Stevens. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no apostrophe on the S, by the way. Uh, good stuff. <laughs> hey, Liz, great to hear from you. Uh, yes. And, and call in every week. We love to hear from you. Uh, oh, hope yes. You're doing well down there with, yep. uh, with your husband, Eric, and everybody. And, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk again soon. 
Absolutely. Love listening. Have a good night, guys. See you, Liz. Thanks. Thanks for calling. See you, Liz. Bye. <laughs> well, again, if, you, if you'd like to join us, uh, just push that uh, call button down at the bottom. Ice man, real quick, um, and Mark, you, you've talked about uh, your enjoyment of, of experiencing the, the party side of Las Vegas and other tournaments. You know, some of the greatest times I've ever had internationally with Iceman, especially in the early years, um, you know, we'd work all day at these events, uh, which usually internationally with that Swiss system or, or the qualification elimination uh, format would end at nine or 10 o'clock. So all of us, and I, by all of us, I mean all of us uh, involved in these events, players from 30 different countries, uh, at least 10 players from each of those countries would head up to town. Uh, in this case, St. Vincent, Italy, the uh, site of the ITSF World Championships. And there was one bar up there in town. I mean, literally one bar that all of us went to. And I looked across the room. I look across the room about halfway through the evening. And there's this huge crowd standing around this one guy. And, and so I fight my way through there over there. And there and there's Iceman. All right. There's Iceman drink in hand. Just entertaining everybody. I mean, this is he's Eddie Murphy. I mean, he is on fire. And, and the whole crowd is laughing in unison with his jokes. Uh, and even the ones who couldn't speak English were laughing. Uh, and it was it was just you remember you remember that night well I'm sure or vaguely, uh, or do you? And it was those were some of the greatest times weren't they Ice? No, there's no doubt. Um, I can still remember. Uh, rest in peace, uh, uh, Pete. He showed me this little trick with with a ring and a uh, and a chain. And you could do this little trick where you try to catch the uh, catch the ring on the chain, or either you, you could or you couldn't. And that little trick had everybody just they couldn't believe it. They they were dumbfounded, and everybody wanted to see this trick. And I had at one time I had the entire bar watching me do this little trick. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like you're cutting your thumb off was it really that magical i mean come on we're adults here right what, were you, what was this trick dude it sounds amazing it was so simple it, it was unbelievable but if, awesome. if, if they knew the trick they would go get out of here <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, for some reason, here, none of us can re none of us can remember the particulars of that night for some reason, Mark. That was in Germany, Ice, and I do remember that. I think it was uh, ITSF World Champion, or rather, a P for P World Championships, right around twenty. Yeah, uh, that was a, that was a great evening. But but that's again a, a testament to to how well liked and loved Iceman is around the world. Anytime we would travel, um, you know, they they would flock towards him and they'd look at me and say, "Hey, who's your friend?" You know. And, uh, and so Iceman, a very popular guy uh, internationally, both as a player. Uh, and again, uh, you played on multiple. Um, in fact, here, here's one for you, folks. If you want to go to Inside Foods TV or just Google or, or just uh, search on YouTube, the world's fastest yeah. foosball shot, question mark. Man. The fastest foosball shot, question mark. And first see who shoots it and then see who's playing goalie for him at the Bonzini World Championships. Aha. Uh -huh. I think I am. Speed will. Just blindingly speed. Yeah, talk a little bit about that event and, and the, the 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 Bonzini push kick. <laughs> Unbelievable shot, man! <laughs> that, that's all you got. He, he's speechless. He's speechless. So, those of you who haven't seen it, uh, check it out for yourself. Um, but it was uh, it was a lot of fun internationally. He was, uh, he was a guy that, that really, really – and, again, I think um, Liz touched on it earlier as well. Uh, yes, he was coach of Team USA, but internationally especially, uh, you'll always see Iceman over on the table talking with some of the young kids or even some of the up-and-coming players. Even some of the top pros in Europe would come over and, and he listen to Iceman break a game down. Uh, just a great coach in general. Probably You're, you're probably not uh, getting all of your talents used for Team USA because it's not as needed. But Iceman is a great coach when it comes to teaching the game to young players. Uh, is that something you really embrace and something you really enjoy, isn't it, Ice? Yeah, you know, I, I think I get it from my, my dad, um, which I guess is appropriate for the day. But uh, oh, yeah. my dad was a teacher. Oh, yeah. And so I can't, if I'm walking around, if you know, especially if I'm walking around, and we're at an international uh, tournament, 
and you know the the U.S. the USA team they they're we're rock stars. Even I'm a rock star, and I'm not as nowhere near the talent of you know a Tony Spradyman or Ryan Moore and uh, all those guys. But uh, they still, I, I just can't sit around and watch somebody trying to trying to learn a shot, and I know how to do it without saying without saying anything. I, I I can't do it. I have to say, hey, let me show, let me show you something. A natural born coach, natural born. Yeah, I guess we could say that. I mean, I had, I had one guy from Austria. Uh, kind of the same thing happened, and it was probably thirty people around the table, and I kind of stood up and I started to walk away. And the, one of the guys looked at me and he goes, from now on, you are the trainer. And I said, what? He said, you are the trainer. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds weird, dude. <laughs> Just want to throw that out. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> was he American or where was this dude from? Just creepy off the street Hamburg dude? You're the trainer. Okay. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, I think, he, I think he said he was Austrian. Uh, and the Austrians uh, a very they speak great English there, and they identified quickly that uh, Iceman indeed was a trainer, which is probably a phrase that they would you know, translate from Austrian to English. Uh, but but a great yeah, coach of, of, of players, and, and you know I've learned a lot from Iceman as well, just playing the game. Uh, I played go- forward for him many times um, overseas, internationally. And he would always have a little thing for me, just one little thing. He'd say, like three words, and it was enough. It was enough for me to go, oh, yeah, okay, all right, let me switch that up. And nine times out of ten, 99 times out of 100 times, it worked. I have fond memories of Iceman, like 1.30 in the morning on pit table number one, and we just look up at each other like dead inside because we're so fatigued, and we just say, I just broke you down, fool. I just broke you down. So we just say back and forth to each other for like another hour before it was bedtime. How about you, Ice? You remember this broke you down, fool, conversations with no one else around but you and me on table one? <laughs> what are <you> talking about? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Great times, man. You know, guys talk about the World Cup. I want to go to the World Cup. I want to go really badly now. I mean, it's a great regret of mine. And so this is kind of the thing, right? Now I haven't played foosball. I wasn't playing much anyway. But now that I don't have the option to play, I feel more regret than ever. I really want to go to World Cup. Maybe I'll bring my wife if she wants to come along and hang out. But I'm looking forward to it, man. You guys, what do you guys miss now that you can't play foosball? Is there something you didn't know you were going to miss that you miss? Jim and I, both of you. What do you think? Well, uh, certainly for me, the, you know, the players, the community, uh, the competition, um, the getting out of the house with the kids home 24-7, um, you know, all of, all of these things. And there's so many things, Mark, that, uh, that, we, that we do miss about the Pro Tour, and I know everybody out there listening is probably feeling uh, in a similar way. Um, you know, Iceman, uh, what about you? And I know Ice hasn't played as extensively over the last few years, hasn't been out on tour quite as much, but – what do you miss, as Mark said? Well, it's just, it's mainly the people, man. Yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a social creature just like everybody else. You know, you want to get out and you uh, see your friends. I mean, this game is about family. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's Thinking the same everybody. Time. Yeah, you, you want to, it's like every weekend it's like a Thanksgiving. You know, you want to go out and see your family every weekend. And, and and when that's taken away, you it, it leaves a void. Yeah. So and you got to make that connection somehow. I mean, it's 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 tough, but uh, hopefully, Foos Talk Live does some of that, brings people together to at least uh, uh, reminisce about some of those times, and then uh, make plans for the future. <coughs> Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. You know, for most of our guests, guests Ice, uh, we do ask them about the movie Foosballers, of course, uh, showed on ESPN, uh, what, nine days ago, released earlier this year. Um, Your thoughts about the movie, uh, the impact, potential impact of it, uh, how you saw it, how you felt that Joe Hesslinga treated the sport. Uh, Give give us your thoughts on on the movie Foosballers. Um, 
I thought it was the best thing ever ever done on, on the game of foosball because um, I was arguing on um, Facebook the other day because somebody was complaining about not being in the movie. I said, look, guys, uh, I don't think you, you realize what it takes to do a, you know, a project like that. This is not, not a bunch of movie. This is not a bunch of clips just thrown together, and yeah. hopefully it works. I said, all this has to be put together, and then you have to even, you got to put in legwork now to even try to even have it shown anywhere. I said, you have zero idea what it takes for such an operation to happen. I said, you should be congratulatory, if anything. Oh, no doubt. I mean, if, I mean, it's the, it provided the best light ever and some insight behind a lot of, behind a lot of the great players that used to play and that are still playing. So in my opinion, it, I mean, I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Can I interject too? Cause I want to add on to this conversation. I didn't, yeah, um, I'd heard about it and I didn't, uh, I, I told myself I was going to get around to watching it. And when I watched it on ESPN, I was so moved. Um, I had people reaching out to me on, on Facebook Messenger saying they watched foosballers. They knew I played foosball. People that were strangers to the game were moved by it. Mm -hmm. I thought the narrative was beautiful. And I think one of the things, and so like part of my niche up in the inside foos booth was to add, add color. And sometimes I just meant completely disassociating. And to be frank, um, you know, riding the line between making fun of people, laughing with them, laughing at them, hopefully. And I know I've, I've rubbed some people the wrong way, but it was a reminder of humanizing these colleagues of mine in foosball and the emotion and the commitment and the love for the game and the passion really rang through in that narrative. And how fortunate was it to have Todd Lafredo in the finals? Um, yeah. with Tony. Yeah. How amazing was that? So just, I, I just want to say that it was to your point, um, Ice, it is probably the, the most uh, emotional storytelling we could have at this point regarding foosball. I think it resonated with strangers and especially people that were personal in the game. And for me, it was very introspective and self-reflecting on my relationship. I felt like reaching out to everybody. I reached out to a few people that were in the movie just to tell them how, how lovely it was. And uh, I thought it was amazing and, and great for the game, the sport. Yeah, I, I agree. And I'm glad, you know, the first time I saw it was in a, a theater in Los Angeles, which was kind of cool. But I'm glad it was dark in there because for the first half hour, I think I, I literally was crying. It was it was a very emotional experience, to, feeling good about what he was doing uh, and, and just the emotion of it all. And I think that's the perfect, perfect word for it. It was very, very moving uh, for those of us who have been involved, certainly with at the level we all have uh, for as long as we have. Well, there's something then to be said for the story of family there as well. I mean, tracing uh, between uh, the second generation players like Tony Spradham and his dad, Bud. What a great aspect to that movie. It just that just pulls you right in. It doesn't matter whether you're a foosball player or not. You know what's, you know what's amazing about that? You got, I was on listening when you were talking about second generation. And I'm in my what I do professionally. I get to see first generation and second generation surgeons across, and I've been able to see it in different anatomy. Um, so I've seen it in gynecology, I've seen it in ophthalmology, and it's a very interesting dynamic. And I'd say, uh, and this is a generalization, so we can't apply it every single time, but for the most part, the second generation surgeon, just like the second generation foosball player, is the recipient of a legacy of information and guidance, also gets the earlier start. And it sure. absolutely translates that the second generation has all these advantages. Now, there's a character piece that comes into play, and there's a work ethic piece that doesn't always translate. But it's like the second generation foosball player has all the advantages and all the opportunity to improve upon the first generation. That seems to be true, whatever the craft is. Hmm. Yeah, great point. Great point. Well, very well said. Yes, we kind of come full circle, don't we, Tom? We, we started off talking about Father's Day and and handing down that legacy, as Mark suggests. And I'm hoping to do that with my son and daughter uh, yeah. moving forward. And I think as a father, you, you and Mark, I know you're a father of, of twin girls, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it, it it really becomes your focus, doesn't it? Uh, 
you see it kind of in a secondhand way in your in your business, as do I. But then it's immediate for us as well. When we go home, this is our main focus. This is my primary focus is sending what I have learned through my life uh, to my children. And I know you feel the same way, Mark. And I think you eloquently really illustrated it beautifully there, both for for you know what you do. And then, of course, uh, uh, these young players, these second generation players that, that we have these days. But but it really is a primary focus of a father and maybe Tom with your cats as well. Um, yeah. but, <laughs> right. but it really is oh, you know, taking cool. everything. And of course, I waited till I was later in life to have children. And, and I think they got the best of me because of that and, and everything that I can offer them. And it's a daily thing, especially these days, 24 seven, I'm telling you. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, okay. but it is, and, and Mark, you put it beautifully. I couldn't have put it better myself. And, and it really kind of brings us full circle here on this, on this Father's Day uh, in 2020. Yeah, love that. Love that sentiment. So, Jim, here's a quick question for you. Uh, please don't take offense, but how how are you going to feel when you're commentating on your your uh, one of your kids playing in the finals at uh, the World Cup? Ooh. It is it is the it is very difficult. Now, I've, I've experienced this certainly with my wife Amy, who is, I have commentated on numerous occasions. I mean, Amy, a top pro player, especially earlier in her career, a third place finisher in women's singles at the World Championships, and I've commentated her matches. Nice. Again, it's, it's, it's like uh, commentating in Europe and not being an American. Uh, in that situation, I, I am not a husband. I really can't be. I have to stay uh, detached a little bit. I have to say, uh, stay fair. And it's something I really take pride in uh, across the board. I, I don't think anyone would ever say to me, and if they do, they'd be wrong, um, that I am showing any sort of bias towards any player. And that includes my wife. I, now, the children? It may be a little tougher, of course, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I would hope I would hope that I would be able to stay uh, as uh, as detached in, in middle of the road as I possibly could. And then you can break down in a, in a sobbing heap at the end of the match. <laughs> yes. And, and then I'm, there I am down on table number one, holding my daughter in my arms and telling her that, hey, Sully is Sully's 15 years older than you. Come on. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, you know, Ezekiel, I got to say, you know, I and I know that everybody's calling you Iceman, but I can't help it. I just I know you as Ezekiel. Uh, you, <clears throat> you are the most generous person that, that I have met so far uh, in, in this industry uh, in foosball when it comes to just, you know, your willingness to talk about the game. You just seem yes. you're just so passionate about this. Uh, just, I can't help it. I love it. Yeah. Oh, it comes right through. Um, it comes right through. Yeah, it's been great hanging out with a couple of old buddies. Brad Anderson apparently out for a steak dinner tonight, so it's not able to join us. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure Brad will again down the road because because Brad was right there in the middle of, of a lot of what we did. Tom, your as well. Uh, I can remember many times in the Inside Foods booth. Uh, I think there was. I have a photograph on my wall of Mark sitting next to me, Brad on the other side, Iceman. I'm literally looking at it right now. Iceman adjusting his headphones down there, uh, working the mixing board. Uh, in fact, I'll take a picture of that and put it on Facebook tonight. But so just wonderful times and, and times that every so often uh, when Mark shows up in Vegas, we get another little taste of whether we want it or not. Um, and, uh, and we're we really good for one match. Time. I'm good for one match anyway. No, and and yeah. if anybody has, has, has read Mark Torres uh, online on Facebook or wherever, uh, obviously listening to him, especially with that last uh, brilliant soliloquy, this is a, a really, really smart, introspective guy who knows the game of foosball. And that was the one that really got me, Mark. When we started doing this together, you were funny, you were smart, but you really knew the game. And I, I think, Iceman, you'd agree with that as well. We were a little surprised at just how good and how knowledgeable Mark Torres was about the game of foosball. Oh, yeah. Well, you, Mark had some pretty high-powered friends, you know, uh, Lewis Cartwright. Yeah. I know he, he and he and Lewis are great friends, even though if, you know maybe you might not think you have to hear him go back and forth with each other. But <laughs> <laughs> and, and Lewis, one of the smartest players to ever play the game, uh, I'm sure you'd both agree yeah. with that. I'll, yeah, you guys, I'm really flattered, and I'm grateful for the um, the recognition. I will tell you that um, I was a better student of the game. I was too lazy to practice hard, and I was too distracted. And so that was always going to be a detriment to me. And so I'm, I'm very proud and I'm very impressed with those of you, especially the masters and the winners, that put the time, dedication, and effort in. I was, I was always going to be better at pontificating and trying to illuminate the game than I was playing just out of sheer lack of exercise. But other than that, I was just flattered to join you guys up there. You guys are brilliant, and I, I loved it up there, and I hope to do it again. 
Well, as we sort of uh, wind things down here on a Sunday night, one more thing I wanted to touch on with with Iceman. Um, early on in our travels uh, to Europe, Iceman you know, got a camera, got a really nice camera early on, and he's had probably eight or 10 or 12 or 15 other nice cameras since then. But you really got into photography, and you, you early on at these big events were taking pictures, really good pictures. I've got a couple of them hanging on my wall. But photography is another love of yours, I know, to this day, uh, both foosball, uh, landscapes, a pool, because uh, I know you're so involved with uh, with pool leagues, et cetera. But talk a little bit, Iceman, about your love of photography. Um, you know, it. you you were part of the reason I kind of got into it. Uh, because before, all I had was a little point and shoot, and I would just kind of snap a picture here and there. Well, on our run back to home one time, I think we were in Italy. Uh, I actually left my camera. It was like, like I said, it was a little small camera. I actually left my camera in. And, um, uh, I forgot the uh, insecurity. Mm. And I was like, oh, come on, dude. You didn't just do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so I, I decided, I said, okay, well, I'm going to buy a new camera. So I said, if I buy a new camera, it's going to be a real camera. And so I did. And so then I started taking pictures, taking pictures here and there. And what I found different with taking photos, it was, it, I had heard all about it, but it, it actually... It actually does freeze a second in time. And if it's a good picture, I don't care if it's 20 years from now, you can see that one picture and remember exactly what was going on. Sure. And you know, and I, I felt bad for Jim sometimes. Man, I used to bug the hell out of Jim. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey. Jim, what do you think about this one? Look at this one. Jim, Jim, look at this one. And Jim's like, Jesus, dude. I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've, I, over the years, I've gotten more patience with questions like uh, that with my, with my kids asking me uh, questions constantly. But no, I was, uh, Iceman showed her talent early, uh, early on, you know, and, and I told him that. I encouraged it, you know, early on because, he did. As, as you say, you capture a moment, literally a, a snapshot in time. And when you look at it, as you said, and that was a great point. You can really go back and feel, almost smell what it felt like and smelled like and looked like and, and, and it puts you back there in that time. And, and really, it's so much. And as you, as you get a little older, you, you, you really value those sorts of things, those memories, don't you? And, you know, something else of them. Um... We were talking. What, what a lot of people didn't really realize about inside foods was kind of like the uh, the pro tour foosball. You know, the world the world knew the United States as the uh, the bet having the best foosball players. I mean, we had the the biggest tour and the best players and the most players at the time. And Europe had a had a kind of a second tier type but they had a lot more players uh, so the same thing with inside food when we got there uh, I don't think they realized how good Jim's vision was on how a tournament should be commentated and a tournament should be viewed all these, all these growing pains that they were going through Jim had already done it for 15 years. Right. I mean, to this day, and something else that's funny, we met this, uh, I can't remember his last name. Jim, you're going to have to uh, remind me. It's Joseph. Mm -hmm. uh, we we butted heads. He, me and this Joseph guy. Joseph Cornelius uh, of Germany. Yep. Yeah. We butted heads uh, uh, for two days straight in Hamburg. But 
once they start figuring out, like for example, uh, the TV tables, uh, we would get it. We would get the table set up, and I would ask Jim. I said, "Okay, is the table where you need it to be?" He goes, "That's perfect." Then I would get duct tape and duct tape the feet. I'm not duct tape the feet, but around the feet where the table should be. And people were saying, well, what are you doing? I'm saying, so I would tell them, you don't have to keep continuously trying to guess where you need to put the table. You put it on the mark. And they, they, they were scratching their head like, oh, my God. But we never thought of that. I said, I know you did and now when I go overseas and I see that those little marks down on the TV table on the floor, I just kind of grin to myself. That's like they learned that from us. You know, they had, they had no clue on how to do any of that. No template. That's it. Well, you know, one of the things that, uh, that, that comes to mind here when it comes to this kind of a legacy of 20, what is it, 26, 27 years of inside foos, uh, this is actually telling the history of the game. Uh, and, and down the line, let's say 30, 40 years in the future, people are going to look back at this era, and that's how they're going to know what the game was like by watching those videos. Yep. Well, we certainly hope so. I mean, uh, that it, we are certainly conscious of that, and certainly more so now than ever. But I, I do take great pride in, in kind of being the unofficial historian of the sport and, and Iceman uh, and, and Mark as well. Certainly are part of that uh, legacy, the inside foos legacy of, uh, of the last 27 years now. But it is something we're conscious of. We take pride in it. It's something that's necessary. And it's something that really didn't exist before we started doing this. So there was no template for, for starting inside foos back then. We kind of had to to, to play it by ear as we went along and make the uh, appropriate adjustments. And it, it certainly made it a lot easier when I had quality guys to work with. And, and that remains the case now. Um, when I've got good people around me, the product is better. Mark made it better. Uh, and no question about it. Still to this day, I get comments about, about how people love Mark Torres. I get comments about how people <laughs> hate Mark Torres as well. <laughs> but, 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 on, but as far as Iceman goes, it's, it's nothing but, you know, and many people remember the, the, the days when Ice was, was working the board for me. And, uh, and it was quality uh, production, quality entertainment, and, uh, and as you say, Tom, a, a piece of history as well. Yeah, no question about it. It's good that somebody's there to chronicle this because it is, it's history. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, and I don't know how we exactly chronicle what's going on now. I mean, at Inside Foods TV, we are certainly trying to keep the, the viewership uh, connected with our reports and with our classic videos, et cetera. Uh, a lot of great ideas, a lot of time to come up with great ideas these days. I, I really feel like all of us who are involved with the sport in, in an intimate way are going to hit the ground running once we do resume tournaments. Uh, uh, I know I am. I know Inside Foods TV will. Um, and hopefully, Iceman, we're going to see you out much more out on tour. Mark? Once a year is about all I can handle of you, but, <laughs> right. um, but, I, but I look forward to that once a year uh, and, and actually hopefully more. And if you come to World Cup, you certainly got a, a seat in the booth next to me to, to talk about awesome. international foosball as well. <laughs> so Mark, awesome. Well, Mark, I got to tell you that uh, Howard Stern is going to retire eventually, so somebody's going to have to pick his place. So okay, then, sign me up. Yeah. He's going to have to grow his hair and grow about a foot in height as well, but um, <laughs> <laughs> among other things, yeah. Get friends. This is probably important in that gig. So, some things yeah, will work for on. sure. Well, first of all, Mark, thanks for thanks for joining us uh, here tonight, spending uh, the last hour and now forty minutes almost with us, and celebrating uh, uh, one of your good friends in foosball, um, Iceman Moore. Uh, we appreciate you you coming in, and we'd love to hear from you every week. In fact, I, I approached Mark last week with an idea of maybe him coming in with a topic. Uh, obviously, Mark knows pretty much everybody we're going to be talking to here, but I, I really enjoy Mark's perspective on things in general and on foosball in specific. So, Mark, uh, the invitation there is open for you to, I don't know, to spend an hour and 40 with us, but to certainly come in uh, in every show and, 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 uh, and contribute because you are you are a guy who contributes a lot to these sorts of discussions. I'm there, man. I'm there. I'm there every week. Thank you. The door is wide open. Hey, Anytime. Work on, your, work on your French, buddy, and, and we'll see you in Nantes next year. Hopefully. All right, sir. Will do. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Mark Doris. 
on Foos Talk Live. And of course, this is this has been a, a, another historic night when it comes to uh, talking about foosball uh, in general. Because of course, we can't play Foos Talk Live. Of course, has been uh, has been created for this purpose to kind of connect us all together in the meantime. And uh, who knows? Maybe when we start playing again, we'll we'll start doing the live uh, live feeds from from uh, from tournaments. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you and I, of course, have talked about that as well. Moving forward, uh, Boost Talk Live is going to hit the ground running as well once things resume. Yes. And I think it's going to be a, a, certainly a, a major part of the fabric of, of the quilt that is uh, foosball here in this country and around the world. And I think that uh, Iceman, I think that you are, you ought to be there to uh, to make sure that we get all the all the, the sound correct and uh, and if with there's any images, <laughs> we definitely got to get you to take some photography. You know, get get in there and uh, get the get the visuals. Yeah, I think I can do the visuals. Right. I don't know about the, the the sound. That's Jim's expertise, but yeah, I can take a few pictures. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Well, Ice Man, uh, Ice and I, uh, uh, Zeke Ice Man, more one of my best friends in foosball, no question about it. In fact, at, at most events, uh, we've we've skipped a few recently, but we try to to have a dinner every time I come down to Texas uh, and spend a little time together. And we're going to make sure we do that again here in the future. But really, been great to hang out with you, buddy. Uh, we miss you, and we hope to see you out on tour soon. Um, and just keep doing what you're doing, man. All right, thanks, man. And uh, yeah, thank you for taking the time to spend with us. Uh, I mean, I, I've, for the short period of time I've known you, I feel like we've been friends for a l- much longer period of time. Just just that's the way you, you are as a person. Oh, that's awesome, man. I, I appreciate that. No, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, uh, just an outsider coming in to, uh, to, to watch this wonderful game. Yeah. Oh, oh uh, I almost forgot. Uh, I meant to ask Jim. Uh, we had this conversation, uh, Tom, you, you and I, yes, about the end of the end of the movie when the consensus to right the movie did the, the movie did come up. Who's ballers? Yes. Uh, did Jim? Do you know what the significance was of how the players were standing at the end of the movie? when uh, they were showing all of their accomplishments. I told Tom that you you would probably know because you were a big part of making the movie. But uh, Tom, I, t- I told Tom about it, and he, he didn't have an idea. And I also made a post here in Dallas after the movie about, uh, did it, I said, did anybody notice how they were standing at the end of the movie when they were showing their accomplishments. I said, I thought that was a nice, cool little exclamation mark. Nobody, nobody knew what I was talking about. Huh? And I was wondering what did Jim do? Does Jim know? Well, um, you know, I certainly remember and, and saw it, and I, I had no input at all into it. Uh, but when they showed all the various titles, and of course, Cindy Head's come to mind, and her screen was rather crowded. Yeah. Are you talking about the particular way they were standing or where they were standing? Yeah. Be more specific if you can. Uh, it went by you too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> I, I'm now going to immediately rewatch after I post that picture of all of us in the booth. But I'm going to um, I'm going to rewatch it and I'll see if I can come up with an answer for you. But uh, so you know, there, there, there's so much to see in that movie. There's just so much to see, and you see it the first time you watch it. Get the cat out of the bag, then. Well, you, do you want to? Uh, I do can. That? I mean, uh, well, do you want to do that on a future episode of Foos Talk Live, or do you want to give it uh, give it to? I mean, because I'm going to it's going to drive me nuts until they get a chance to. <laughs> <read it. laughs> yeah. Hey, it's up to you. I can tell you now. All right, yeah, well, let's t- hear it. Let's hear it. And then we can all go back and have a look at it. You said go ahead and tell you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at the end of the movie, of course, like w- what you were saying, they were showing everybody's accomplishments. And they were standing in a particular way. They were all standing like football men. Oh, yes. Yes, they were. And, and now that you yeah. mentioned that, yes, they were. They had their hands, their arms tucked to their sides and were standing up straight. You are correct. That is. Oh, correct. now that's interesting that you said, I, I, you know, now I recall that. Yes, but I didn't know that there was, I was just thinking they were trying to do this because they had to kind of um, crush in all the different titles, like with the, with Todd Lafredo. How do they fit yeah. all that stuff in? I thought, well, he's got to be very, 
he's going to be very still. So it doesn't, uh, yeah. Wow. That's extraordinary. Another uh, a very insightful uh, a bit of art from from our good friend Joe Hesslinga, who did just such a great job with it. And, and look for more things in the, in the future from Joe as well, foosball related. Yes. Uh, as we move forward. Oh, that's exciting. Very exciting. Uh, it, it seems that, that uh, there's a someone struck the match and lit the fuse. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can't wait for the explosion. Uh, so, so Ezekiel, is is uh, is there anything that uh, that you're doing right now to uh, to keep in tune when it comes to, to foosball? Are you practicing at home? What are you doing? Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking I might put my table back up and start playing again. Okay. Uh, every now and then, I think I've told you this before. We had a um, a local player who wanted me to show her how to shoot a pull shot because she was she was hurting her wrist. Yes. So I agreed. I agreed to uh, to go out and help her shoot the sh- show her how to shoot the pull shot without you know putting any damage. Injury. On, yeah, on her on her uh, on her wrist. And so I may I don't know I may start going out again. Nice. Okay. Well, we we, uh, we hope that for uh, for that to happen uh, soon, of course, and uh, we're we're looking forward to, like Jim was saying, seeing you out of the on, out in uh, in competitions and uh, and tournaments coming up very soon. But uh, my gracious thanks to you for for taking your time out to uh, to talk to us this evening from from Dallas, Texas. Uh, it's it's an extraordinary honor getting a chance to hang out with you. Thank you. Oh, one of the the one question that came up: the greatest player. To never play a World Cup yeah. uh, was one of my partners, Charles Britt. Yeah. First man to ever win two uh, Masters singles titles. Charles retired pretty early in the early 90s. And yeah. really, uh, it was several, probably a decade or more uh, before we really started international play. So that's kind of understandable. But in his time, no doubt, Charles Britt, a great player. Yeah. Very cool. What, what a great way to, to finish off our conversation. Absolutely. With one of the greatest players. Now, hopefully, um, you know, this uh, in the future, we can have more questions like this, especially as uh, as we move forward with Foos Talk Live, maybe a, a, a weekly kind of question like that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again, buddy. Thanks, Ice. Take care, man. I know you're not 100 percent. I'm feeling great, but uh, thanks for joining us anyway. And I hope you had a good time. Well, thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome, man. It's it's an absolute honor having you with us. Thank you. All right. Have a great night, man. I will. Well, Jim, there you go. It's uh, It seems yeah. that we've, we've managed to do it again, once again. Yeah. Well, it's all about the guests. And uh, Iceman's got a lot of stories and a lot of the – there's many other stories that he didn't even get to tonight. But uh, definitely, as I said, one of my best friends in foosball and uh, just great memories with this class act out of uh, Irving, Texas. They're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I spent a UPS driver who I imagine is working 60 to 70 hours these days and, and yeah. a hardworking man and, and just, a, just a great guy all around. And I know everybody out there listening who has had any experience, any contact with Iceman knows what a great uh, human being he is, what a great coach he is, what a great foosball man he is. No doubt about it. I just wanted to uh, give you a quick update uh, before we uh, sign off. I know that we talked uh, with Tony Sprademan and then uh, Brandon Moreland uh, yeah. with Tony, uh, with uh, Foos, Foos by Tony and Foos by Brandon. And they were giving me some tips uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was sitting in the front seat of my car. Right. Yeah. Uh, how, how did that go? So, so you actually, you actually sent a tape into them, didn't you, of, of your game? Uh, I and, did. And Tony, Tony did break it down a little bit. But have you played since then and, and been able to sort of implement some of those ideas? I actually have. And, and, and just the one thing that I got to say that I added was the, the five man. Uh, they said that I was rolling my 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 hand or rolling my hand on the, yes. on the rod. Uh, so now I'm now when I practice, I make sure that I keep a not a firm grip, but a uh, a grip where I'm not rolling my hand. It's more like turning a doorknob, as Brandon said, uh, yes. rather, rather than uh, letting it roll. And it's it's actually uh, made a huge difference. And uh, I've been practicing the the catching of the ball. It's made it easier for me to catch the ball. Yeah. Well, there you go. So there you go. Kudos to those guys. Uh, they've actually made a difference. And uh, I, I, wanna, I just want to say, I highly recommend Foos by Tony and Foos by, by Brandon. Uh, yeah, just go to, go to Facebook and you can check out the Foos by series with either of those two brilliant foosball players, two of the best in the world. 
uh, great players and apparently great teachers as well, if they can teach you, Tom. Oh, well, <laughs> that is saying that something. <laughs> Not quite how I meant it to come out, but you, you, you get it. But, it. but what I'm saying is they can teach anyone, you know, sure. and, and that's the key. You don't have to be a great player and you can be a beginning player. You can be a player like yourself, a, a rookie player and uh, and get something from these these great guys. So check them out on Facebook. Um, yes. uh, Food the Blues by Series with uh, both Tony Spreadman and Brandon Morley. Highly recommend that. Also, along with our sponsors this evening, 518 Prince, uh, Jesse and, and uh, Mel are in business to uh, to put together your favorite apparel with your team. Uh, uh, could be for your company, whatever the case, but they're definitely very busy. Uh, but they are waiting for you to uh, contact them through 518prince.com. Also, Fool's Ballers, the movie, the Joe Hessling documentary we've been chatting about tonight. Uh, Foosball Clubs USA with John O'Brien, another great sponsor. And, of course, Foos by Tony and Foos by Brandon. And, uh, wow, what a great time tonight. It really was. And I'd like to remind everybody also to head over to Inside Foos TV at YouTube and uh, subscribe and, and check out uh, now, I think, more than 100 videos that we have there and reports and more to come. Uh, and also InsideFoos.com where you can choose from more than 200 video sets season packages, and of course, the complete collection. If you're interested in getting the complete collection on a hard drive, just send me an email. I'll offer you a, a special deal on uh, 27 years of foosball history. Uh, go check it out at InsideFoos.com. Yes, and Jim. And, great show, Tom. Yep, absolutely. And if you want to contact us, Jim, what is your email address? I'll send an email to InsideFoos1 at gmail.com or, of course, uh, Facebook Messenger at Jim Stevens. Either of those will, will work uh, brilliantly. And, uh, uh, and you, Tom? Yep, you can also use uh, info at foosball dot, foosballradio.com, I should say. And uh, we are looking forward to hearing from you and your suggestions and ideas about how to make it better for Foos Talk Live. Uh, we are back together again next Sunday at 9 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time for another edition of Foos Talk Live, a production of Foosball Radio and Inside Foos TV. Jim, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Tom, and we'll see you Foos. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.